You're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello, Book Talk Today family, and welcome back to another episode of the Book Talk Today podcast. My name is Orn, I am your host, and thank you for tuning in to this week's podcast. Apologies for the lack of frequency and consistency with the podcast. Over the last couple of months, I was finishing off a software engineering course and getting a job as well. Thankfully, I've I'll be starting a new full-time position in a couple of weeks, uh, which I'm super excited about at a fintech company as a software engineer, which is super, super exciting, uh, which means the podcast will still continue and I'll try and keep up the frequency as best as possible. But in this week's episode, we are joined by David Kadavi. David is an author, podcaster, and self-publishing coach. His books include The Heart the, the Heart to Start, Stop Procrastinating and Start Creating, Designed for Hackers, and his latest book, Mind Management, Not Time Management, Productivity When Creativity Matters. And our focus on our discussion was really around productivity. And in his book, he talks about some of the must-reads in the productivity game, mainly uh, being Deep Work by Cal Newport and Getting Things Done by David Allen. And my experience with productivity was somewhat falls in line with David's as well, which is this idea that the more that you get in to productivity, whether it be time blocking or in essence managing your time in general, the more focus there is on energy management or mind management. This idea that where your focus lies and how to optimize your focus matters more than managing your time. So for instance, if you're a morning person, that means getting the tasks that are most difficult done in the morning. That means in the afternoon, you can free up time for more uh, less laborious tasks, such as sending emails or just doing administration. And that morning can be, for instance, focusing on deep work, as Cal Newport says, those really cognitively intense tasks. And the opposite, if you're someone who is perhaps a night owl, you leave your writing or your hard creativity tasks for the evening as well. But it's about understanding what's for, what works for you and managing your mind rather than your time. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe, whether you're listening to this on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Subscribing is the easiest way for us to get our message out there and to get more exposure. We have some really exciting authors lined up in the next couple of months, so definitely hit that subscribe button to stay tuned for more exciting interviews. Thank you so much again for tuning in, and I really hope you enjoy this episode with David. David, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Owen, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to have you on, David. I think anyone who has listened to this podcast or follows my content knows my um, slight obsession with reading productivity books. Uh, Cal Newport's Deep Work and David Allen's books are books that I've reviewed and talk about extensively, and there are books that you've mentioned in your book as well. So I have had somewhat of a transformation over the last couple of years of moving away from thinking about time management and more energy management. So I think it's interesting that your book came along and uh, you were kind enough to, to reach out and, and for me to read the book because I think it sort of aligned with the way that I was seeing the subject as well. So I think before we get into some of the, the elements of the book, I think it'd be great for you just to give an introduction about your journey to writing this specific book and mm. and, and and how you you came up with, with that concept. Yeah, I guess I could start a, a number of different places in my life, but probably the most important point would be when I had my first uh, book deal uh, that happened, you know, like 2010 or so, I, I was a designer. Uh, I had been a designer working in Silicon Valley, and then I got a book deal to write a book called Design for Hackers. And I figured, you know, I've, how hard can it be? I've suffered through uh, designing many logos and websites and app interfaces and things like that. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure that. I can figure out how to write this book, but I had a, a, a contract to write this book in six months and you have to give back the money if you don't finish in time. And I found it actually extremely difficult uh, to, uh, to, to write this book. And one of the things that I noticed was that I had plenty of time to write this book. I had cleared away all my clients um, and my, I was only focusing on writing this book. So I had all day really to 
to think about writing this book. I had just, I wasn't going to do anything else. Um, but it didn't really work out how I expected. I actually found that I was just banging my head against the wall 12 hours a day. And then I would have these moments where all of a sudden I, I would be able to write. After not being able to write all day, I would be able to write. And then sometimes it'd be like 15 minutes. I would have an entire chapter drafted. And that's a little frustrating when you see that. Like, okay, I spent 12 hours, but it actually took me 15 minutes. And I started to wonder like, okay, well, what, what's, what's going on here? Why can't I just sit down and write for 15 minutes and then get on with the rest of my day? And that's when I started to dig into this sort of assumption that we have with time management that, uh, that if you put in, invest time in something, that that's going to result in some sort of output. And I actually found that that's not the case at all, especially when it comes to creative work, which is increasingly important, whether you're being creative, you're trying to learn new skills, uh, you're trying to solve problems. These aren't things that are like stacking bricks where you just follow some procedure and uh, you get the thing done. And so that's really where that all started. And that set off this um, 10 year journey of digging into the research on uh, creativity, whether it's the neuroscience or the, uh, or, or the psychology and starting to try to find patterns in how I actually did manage to get that book done and trying to develop a system, uh, that I could repeat and share with others for how to make that sort of 15 minutes of flow happen on command instead of banging your head against the wall, 12 hours. Yeah. yeah. What, what were some of the assumptions that you made then from the transition from Silicon Valley design into writing the book? Because I think people who aren't creative might see the creative process as being universal across different dimensions. But you said that you got that perhaps wrong. So what was an assumption that you made prior to writing the book that seemed to be false once you started? Hmm. That's a great question. I guess I just figured that I would be able to uh, to get through the process because I had certainly designing things when you are, when you're trying to find a solution to a design problem and you kind of have a sort of nebulous idea in your head of what it's going to look like. Um, if you thrash around enough, you get enough ideas on paper, then eventually it's going to, it's going to materialize. Uh, and, and that, and that'll happen. I guess I sort of figured that I could do the same thing with writing. I mean, don't get me wrong. I did not expect it to be easy, mm -hmm. but it was this thing that I felt like I was willing to suffer through. Uh, I didn't expect it to be as hard as it actually ended up being. So, um, yeah, I don't know what, what, what assumptions I was making other than that just, I figured, well, I've done creative things before and have felt and have worked under deadlines before uh, and felt lost in a process where I wasn't quite sure how something was going to turn out and have seen it through to where it all finally did work out, despite the fact that I, I felt like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. I'm worthless. This is never going to this is never going to work. So I just sort of trusted that I could get through that. But it just turned out to be a lot harder than I expected. Um, and also, I, I started to see these patterns happening where uh, there were kind of parallels between what I had learned in trying to solve design problems and what I was learning in trying to solve uh, writing problems where I started to say, hey, there might be something here. So what, 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 was, what were some of those parallels then between those two processes? Yeah, I guess one of them would would be that uh, when you sit down to say design a logo, you don't. It doesn't just come out usually. Like you have to do a lot of research. You're going to do some sketches. You really have to go through a lot of different ideas, and they're not going to work. And you have to be willing to um, put pen to paper and say, okay. I'm going to do a bunch of different options that are not going to work. And same thing with writing, but I think there might be something about writing, especially when you're not a, an experienced writer where it's in, in a way it's a little bit tougher because your expectations are almost higher because you hit a key on a keyboard 
and like a perfectly crisp letter shows up on the screen. And that looks just as crisp as it might if it were well thought through. Whether it's well thought through or it's not well thought through, it looks the same. Yeah. Like you could upload it, you could upload complete gibberish to uh, Kindle and then look at it and it would look the exact same as, say, War and Peace um, in terms of like the visual, like how it looks, right? Yeah. But in reality, and and it's and the logo is that way sometimes. You you see a logo, you see a, a say a logo solution, and you think, oh, that's totally obvious, but you didn't see like the thousands of sketches that went through it, all the market research that went into it, and all that. But you just see that final product. Um, and, but you, you're not maybe as surprised, or at least I certainly wasn't as a trained designer. That was what I studied in college. It's like, I expect that, 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 that's how that's going to be. So maybe that's one assumption there in the, in the, in the process that actually didn't necessarily transfer, but was that when you sit down and you write, you click and you, and you, you type a key, uh, that, that is that what you're typing is the, the final product. Um, I think that there's this thing where like the product is not the process uh, is one, one of the things that I've, I've learned is that what you, what you see of the final product, where there's a, a book, you read a book letter by letter, word by word, one after another, that's the product. Well, the process is not laying down one letter after another in, in order until you arrive at a book. Uh, and so that's actually one of the things that I had to learn about writing that I had learned from doing design work that uh, I guess I sort of didn't expect or wasn't that comfortable with because, you know, in that uh, those initial stages of, say, like doing the book proposal um, where I had to, they said, oh, okay, well, write an outline of this book. Uh I got lucky. I kind of had the, it sort of land in my lap and they were like, write an outline of this book. I'm like, well, how am I going to do that? I haven't written the book. Like I can't, <laughs> how am I going to write an outline for something I haven't written yet? So just, it's very, it was agonizing to sit there and just make every uh, press of the key happen. But if you look behind me, for those who are watching on video, you're going to see a number of different writing devices. A couple of them are typewriters. And one thing I love, and those are not just decoration. I really write with the typewriter now. Uh, and one of the things I love about writing with the typewriter is there's no fooling yourself. This is a first draft. You are going to type this onto a paper and it's going to be wrong. It's not going to be well thought out. Uh, there's going to be misspellings and all sorts of punctuation problems. But no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to like go back over it and comb it through and, and, and have it ready to publish, even if you write a perfect article, you're going to have to transcribe it to electronic form before it can be put mm. into uh, a book or put into a make, become a pod. Well, I guess podcast script I could read it or something, but or in, an article uh, and distribute it out into the world. And so that's one of the things I love about that is that it it gets rid of that expectation that this final product that you're trying to produce is actually what it's going to look like right now while you're in the process the product is not the process yeah, yeah i think that touches upon something that you talked about in the book that i wanted to bring up actually in in the book you talked about this idea of like explore versus generate in the sense of mental states and interestingly enough a very famous author and i watched a podcast that he did with tim ferris uh, neil gaiman the fiction author yeah he, he he so his process is he writes all of his first drafts by hand and he says that by writing it by hand, it takes the pressure off because if he tends to write something on a computer, that tends to be the end product as you talk about. Oh, but perfect. his yeah. process, his process of writing is actually taking what he's done as a first draft by fountain. He does everything by fountain pen. And he actually says that writing is the process of modifying the first draft that he does, changing it, manipulating it, and actually copying it onto like a Word document. So mm -hmm. that's his process of writing. He says it's too much pressure to have it on the computer because once it's on the computer, you feel even worse taking it off. Whereas once you have it on a piece of paper and you put it onto a screen, it feels a lot better than just taking it off the computer. 
Oh, I love that. It's a perfect example. I would add to that though, also that um, maybe one of the assumptions that I had or one of the patterns that I later recognized in going from design to writing was that we tend to think if something is a first draft that you're going to now refer to the first draft when you're writing your second draft. And sometimes you do, and sometimes you are sitting there like typing the same thing, but you're maybe changing a thing here or there. But a lot of the value isn't necessarily coming from the fact that you produced this first draft. Like a lot of the value is actually coming from the connections that you're making in your mind. So another one of the objects that I have uh, behind me is called an Alpha Smart, which is a portable word processor. Uh, they don't, don't make them anymore. You can get them used on Amazon for like $50 or something like that. They have a cult following. They're really just a keyboard with a tiny screen on it. And it holds 12 different files on it. And people are always surprised when I say, well, one of the, my rituals that I love is to take this, this Alpha Smart and type a bunch of stuff on it and then delete it. Now, if, if, if I happen to write something brilliant, I can transfer it to my computer, but I have to connect it with a cable. You know, I've got to call a carrier pigeon to <laughs> pick it up or send it or something. I've got to, you know, get Fred Flintstone to help me out with it or something like that. But um, the thing is that I delete the what I wrote because the value isn't necessarily in referring to the thing that I wrote. The value is that is that the writing is sort of the training wheels for the thinking that later I can hopefully uh, sit down and extemporaneously uh, go through and repeat everything that I just wrote. And it'll come out like that much crisper because it's gotten a chance to solidify in my mind. And I realized that that was happening as a designer all the time, but I never necessarily recognized it uh, because maybe I didn't have enough examples where you you really pour over some sort of solution and you're trying to understand the problem that you're trying to that you're trying to solve. Um, I guess you don't pour over a solution; you're pouring over the problem, uh, and you're racking your brain f on it, and you're not getting anywhere, and you're very frustrated, and you go to sleep, and you wake up the next day, and it's just there, and you mm. rush to your tools, and out it out it comes. And that happened, I, I recognized that that was happening with writing as well. And, um, and so this is something that I learned to kind of be more intentional about was that, yeah, I'm also, I, I love that what you said about Neil Gaiman, like it, it taking the pressure off. That's important because that allows, that frees up the action. But also if you just kind of change your goal to be, well, I'm just trying to exercise the thoughts in my mind, uh, trusting that in the interim between now and the next time I approach this problem that uh, my brain's going to work on the solution. And there's all sorts of research pointing to this idea of subconscious incubation. And you know, there's a lot of different views on where it's coming from, whether it is your mind is actually working on the problem or that you are just uh, forgetting sort of the bad ideas that you had. You have, we can get what's called fixation forgetting, where you get really fixated on the ideas that really aren't that working out. And when the time passes, uh, you forget those. There's also the consolidation of, of memories. You've kind of got your, your, your RAM, your short-term memory that can only hold so many things at once. And then you've got your long-term memory, which can hold seemingly infinite amounts mm -hmm. of information. And a lot of times when you're approaching a, a creative problem and you're trying to solve it uh, all at once, you're, you're, you're trying to use your RAM to take in the information and try to connect it. But if you can yeah. bring, yeah, but if you can bring the information into your RAM and then you bring it to your long-term memory and then clear the RAM, then you can uh, have the space to like pull things from that long-term memory and try to connect them together, you've got more resources left over to try to, to solve those problems. So that's been useful as well, just to understand that one thing I'm trying to do is just get my brain primed to work on this uh, when I'm not working on it. I feel like that's such a, a, a tight balance, though, because I think as a creative person myself and, and you are as well, you always want to be doing something. You always want to be creating something. You always want to feel like you're actively seeking like an, an actual product or you want to see some type of progress. But often it's when you sort of take a step back, let it incubate, as you say in the book and as you've just said now, and 
seemingly like you just give yourself a bit of space and then before you know it you're just creating twice as much as you're doing before when you're just scratching your head and, and beating your head up against the wall so it's a it's a fine balance and it's it's difficult at times yeah and i think one of the things that i've discovered that uh has helped me work through that and is kind of a lot of the idea of the book is really just is to be this sort of perpetual creativity machine um which uh, probably sounds terrible to anybody who isn't it doesn't isn't on fire to create things all the times that you're like oh you're constantly working you're constantly creating something well no, it's just like that's the way that some of us are like you just always have to ABC like kind of like the Gordon is that Gordon Gecko from oh, yeah. uh, uh, ABC always be closing no we're like ABC always be creating. Um, and I've found that if you get a good sense of the way that your energy fluctuates, you can always be doing some sort of creating. You can always be doing something to be moving your ideas forward. Now, I introduced the seven mental states uh, in the book. Seven mental states is, is gets complicated when it comes to like talking about it over audio. Um, we can we can get into them, but just the like, basic idea being that just as you're sort of running out of steam in one mental state, you often find, oh, I actually have uh, a good amount of energy for this other part, uh, for this other mental state that will drive either the same project forward or will drive another project forward. Just as one example, um, I like to spend my mornings writing and I like to spend my mornings on that really effortful uh, writing where you're, 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 you're trying to make it good. You're trying to uh, look at what you're writing over and over again and trying to get it nice and smooth and crisp, but you can only, you, you run out of energy after a while. So then I've got other uh, things I do. Like I have a, a Zettelkasten, which is a database of notes of different ideas and highlights that I've read from different things. And, and I find that, well, I, I don't necessarily have the energy after a really tough writing session to do any more really tough writing, but it can be quite nice to just go on my Zettelkasten and look at some highlights that I've written for a book and then sort of take simple notes on them, copying them. Or, you know, when I'm uh, waiting in line or I'm uh, waiting for an appointment to start, I, I've blocked, uh, I don't have any of the social media apps on my phone. I've blocked them using the content restrictions. And so like one of the only things I have to do then is I can just like open up notes on my phone and just kind of go through highlights that I've exported from a book and say, oh, what are the more interest, most interesting highlights of these highlights? So this sort of liminal time where you feel like, oh, I don't really have time to make progress in anything, you can actually do quite a bit with uh, if you set things up and are mindful of what sort of energy do you have available? What sort of uh, time do you have available? Uh, where you can always be creating, you can always be moving things forward so that, yeah, maybe not in this moment you're coming up with some breakthrough idea, but all the things that you're doing are building up to those moments when you are sitting down at, say, the writing table and and having those insights come to you. Are you very conscious about how you pair the activities that you do to help one another? So, you know, for instance, like for me, I'm a creative person. I'm a software engineer. I do a podcast. I create video content. I you know, play golf. There's like, I, I kind of structure my, my time and the activities that I do so they can help one another. Cause I think that creativity comes in many different forms. And I think each thing that you do helps one another. So do you approach the things that you do, uh, to, to, to help each other? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's what I'm very often keeping my finger on the pulse of in my life and, and trying to uh, uh, reevaluate from time to time. Actually, just recently did this. I, I try to keep, well, people are really into daily routines. Do you hear a lot about daily routines? I really am into yeah. the weekly routine. I love yeah. to just look at how I'm my energy is going to, yeah, look at how the energy is going to fluctuate yeah. throughout the week. Look at the things that I want to accomplish and, you know, build, I've heard this before from various sources, systems, not goals, yeah. uh, is like, what are this, the, what's the sort of process that I could follow over and over again, that will get me towards writing a book that will get me towards preparing 
uh, to do a podcast interview or, or, or be on a podcast? What are the things that I can, I can do and how, how can I manage my energy? So I'm not in a, um, and I'm, I'm not in a state of urgency hardly ever, uh, where it's just things are smoothly transitioning from one thing to the next. So that's, yeah. that's definitely something I think about. And, and it's not, it's, I'm not perfect at it at all. So I just recently did a reevaluation of that where I golf too. I actually recently started a sort of side golf writing project. Uh, and one of the things I discovered is, well, golf is really time consuming. Um, but fortunately I wrote a book called mind management, not time management. And I realized that like spending time working, is it necessarily like the number one thing that's going to improve my output and going out and walking um, 15 miles a week playing golf is actually can be quite beneficial, but it still does take a lot of mental energy if you're trying to take it seriously. Very much and, so. and so for a while there, I, you know, maybe, I, maybe my writing wasn't, I wasn't as pleased with my writing, I think because I was putting a lot of mental energy into the golf and then I was pleased with my writing, but then I, I, I didn't, wasn't doing golfing as well because I was putting more mental yeah. energy into the writing. So like constantly looking at, well, how is, how are the, how are the things that are important to me balancing with one another and where can I add in one little ritual or thing that I do that's going to feed into that system to get me a little closer, uh, to, doing the things that I want to be able to do, uh, with in that particular, uh, activity. What seems to be some of the systems that you personally use that have been beneficial for you? I think in the book, you talk about this idea of, you know, maximizing the one hour rule, which is sort of that first hour in the day for, you know, highly cognitive tasks that you need to get done. So, um, I think it'd be great just to talk about your personal systems and something that is some things that have been beneficial to you personally. Yeah. I think rules, like you just mentioned, the, the first hour rule, yeah. any sort of rule uh, is a nice thing that you can try out. It's easy, very easy to test to say, like, what happens if I, um, if I just spend the first hour of my day on such and such activity and I don't check email, I don't look at the news, I don't look at social media, I don't even go exercise maybe. And... Uh, you just try it for a little while and you see how that works. So I think rules like that are, are really useful. One rule I'm, I'm, I'm experimenting with right now is device-free Mondays. So okay. I also call them prefrontal Mondays sometimes because that's I feel like your prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for planning, uh, is, is a little bit more rested and you can uh, look at things from more of a 30,000 foot view on a Monday morning because you've had the weekend to sort of relax and incubate, hopefully, if you're managing your, your energy well, anyway, uh, and your, in your priorities. I mean, no judgments to people who have really, really, uh, hectic weekends. I understand. But, um, so for these device free Mondays, I just, I got, I write on my typewriter in the morning. I've got these little whiteboards, uh, and I also write in a notebook or on my alpha smart, I'll go to the cafe in the afternoon and I don't go, I don't check email. I don't check any social media. And uh, I've been doing that for a couple of weeks and it's, it's hard. It's hard to, to, to do that. But you always find like just when you get bored, um, you realize, oh, now I've got I'm like thinking more about one of my ideas that I wouldn't have thought about if I had, you know, deflected from that boredom into social media or into checking email or into doing some sort of thing that is sort of is really an activity designed to um, to assuage whatever discomfort I have in, in that moment. Um, so that's, yeah. that's one system or rule that I have. And I'm constantly trying to find ways to formalize whatever it is that I'm creating. And I've got that down to some systems, some creative systems with the things that I create on a regular basis. So for example, I've got my love Mondays newsletter. It's an email newsletter. I've sent over a hundred and over 150 weeks in a row. Haven't missed one. Um, and I've got my podcast, which is currently fortnightly. I've got like an article coming out every couple of weeks. And those have systems that I have, you know, started without much of a system, but have slowly formalized those. And I think of them a little bit like, 
like making cupcakes, you know, like when you make, a, when you make cupcakes, you've got the cupcake tin and, uh, you know, they're all the same size, all these pieces in the tin and you're using the same batter and you pour in the batter and you cook them all at the same time at the same temperature. But once you've done that, then you can put on different frosting, you can put sprinkles on mm. some, like you can actually make a large variety of cupcakes. And I think of content kind of the same way, where it's like, you don't want it to all be the same, but what sort of rules can you say where it's like, okay, these are going to be 500 words or um, there's going to be an image in this part of it, or it's going to be this format where I have this introduction and then this part I've got bullet points or whatever. Like, what can you formalize where you aren't having to think about it any and uh, and you can actually get a lot out of it because you don't have as much mental energy. I mean, I have it down with my with my cooking even where there's a certain like these couple items. Um, my my partner and I, she cuts the vegetables and I do the cooking and it's like down to a system. It takes us like 10 minutes to make dinner and we eat generally the same thing uh, most meals, but we have things that we mix in and out. It doesn't yeah. have to be the same every single time. I think that's an important thing to keep in mind is that I was certainly somebody who didn't like systems, who didn't like routines, who didn't like habits because I thought it was going to make my life boring. But it turns out it's the exact, it's the exact opposite. Mm. I think uh, Gustav Flaubert got a great quote, something like, you'll be rigorous and orderly in your, in your life so that you can be violent uh, and uh, unpredictable in your work. I'm paraphrasing, but... Yeah, yeah. That sort of I think thing. It's, so, it's, it's, it's the idea as well. I came across by this um, by Jocko Willink, who's who's a sort of an ex Navy SEAL, and he has this discipline quote, is freedom. Says, discipline equals freedom. And I, I I listened to a podcast I think a couple of years ago where he talked about this idea that you know people feel like discipline is sort of a crux. It's like a um, you're sort of boxing yourself in. You're not allowing yourself to do certain types of things, being free or having free time. But he said it's the complete opposite. You know, be disciplined with your exercise that means you'll be sort of free from any illnesses you know um if if they're not sort of if they don't sort of just happen to you in a way or you know financially if you're disciplined that means you'll have you know more money and, and you'll have freedom in a different way and i think perhaps there's something to do with creativity as well in there it's you know if you're disciplined with how you approach your creative output that means you have more freedom to do the things that you want whereas you know one of the things that i had or an assumption for creativity before i actually started creating uh was this idea that you know a creative just has ample free time and they just you know, <laughs> I, I had this uh, author on the podcast, um, Andrew Graham Dixon, who's an art historian, and we we're talking about Michelangelo, and you mentioned Michelangelo in the book as well. And some of the things that we talked about is that, you know, you almost think that these artists, they just sort of pluck creativity. These ideas come to them, you know, from, you know, some ethereal nature and it comes down to them. But the thing you realize is they're incredibly disciplined. They're incredibly laborious in the way that they plan, execute and and put these things into into fruition. And I think a lot an assumption that a lot of people make is that it's sort of for creatives, it just comes to them naturally. I think Michelangelo is a, a great example, too, because he still has this uh reputation like this sort of i don't know if deific is the right word but like mm. as like oh he's yeah. this untouchable unhuman godlike uh creator and that's actually a perception that he carefully crafted which is great branding when your main clients are popes yeah. uh, <laughs> to make it seem like you were preordained by god to uh, be this un untouchable uh, creative. Like there's, I think one of the more famous Michelangelo quotes, which I don't think he actually said, but it certainly fits this um, perception that he tried to craft of himself is, is that somebody asked him how he carved the David and he said, well, I just removed the parts that weren't David. And uh, I hate that quote <laughs> 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 because it's, first of all, there's no proof he ever said that. And it's totally not true um, because, yeah, he worked in secrecy for for the David. It was like this unveiling. And, it, 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 and it's amazing what he accomplished with it. It is a stunning statue. I When I saw it, I, I literally sat there for two hours just looking at the thing. 
Um, and he was able to salvage this block of marble that other artists had failed with. So, you know, he, he accomplished incredible things with it, but he didn't just remove the parts that weren't David. Like he made models, you know, he like used wire and, and uh, wax and terracotta and stuff and made yeah. models of varying sizes. And even to the point where uh, his, his um, biographer Vasari, who, isn't always the most reliable source, but mm. uh, you know, sometimes you don't have much else to go on, like has shown that he had this apparatus that he created where you take a model and you would uh, uh, lower the model into water and then crank it up a little bit and see what emerges from the water and then chisel away that part of the block of marble so that it matches what you see in the water and then like do that bit by bit until until yes, the uh, the the model emerges, the the sculpture emerges from that block of marble. But it's a very you know it, it it wasn't the magical process that he made it sound like. Yet at the same time, he also he also would would certainly like let his clients know he was working really really hard. Um, you know, and and he was a he was a pretty sour individual, really. Uh, but but like. <laughs> It's just something to keep in mind when people try to think that these these other creators are, you know, not human or, or whatever. Not, not to deny that they're extremely talented and and, and work very hard uh, on those talents, uh, but th this can actually be uh, approached with some intention. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, if you were to see the Sistine Chapel, like I have in, in person, you'd look at it and think, you know, how could one person do that? And you almost write yourself off of any creative activity after it. And I think that's what quite a lot of people do. They see what other people achieve, whether it be, you know, literary writers. And you see, for instance, like anything by Dostoevsky, I absolutely love Dostoevsky. And mm -hmm. I look at his writing and I think to myself, how could I even go about creating anything remotely similar to that? And I know it's a high, it's a high benchmark, honestly, to have Dostoevsky up there um, and, and, and writers as well trying to replicate that or do anything similar. But I think it's something that a lot of people do is they perhaps foreshadow their achievements and before they've even tried to even go down the route. Yeah, and I, I love that you mentioned uh, the Sistine Chapel ceiling as well, because I think that's something that you look up and you're like, wow, this is just incredible. It's incredible. How, how could a it's human incredible. do this? I mean, it's on a ceiling, no less, which is really yeah. crazy. Like all the other chapels at the time just had like dots on them. Oh, it was just paint mm. a starry sky on there or whatever. Mm. But uh, the Sistine Chapel is a, an interesting story because it's one that Michelangelo uh, worked on. Well, there's a number of different things that he did that I think that we can all learn from. One is when he painted that, he wasn't really a painter. He had done like a couple panel paintings and he had done the David and, and he had become famous for that. And then was summoned down to, uh, from Florence, uh, where he was doing a face off with, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. That's a, another story. Um, he came down to Rome, worked on Pope Julius's tomb that didn't really get finished. Then he was tasked with working on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So anyway, he he worked on it for a few weeks and then he chipped away everything that he had worked on. So he had to start over. Uh, I thought that was interesting because he because one, he, he sort of started on like a, a an inconspicuous part of the chapel as if he kind of knew, you know, I kind of don't know what I'm doing with this. Let's try out this part. That's a little inconspicuous. Try it for a few weeks. And I think there were some problems with uh, it, was, it was fresco. You've got it like paint yeah. on plaster and once you're done like you're, it's literally set in stone you can only way to fix it is to chip it away and start over again and so we worked on it for a few weeks ended up chipping that over chipping that away starting over again and then he paints the whole first half of the ceiling they take down the scaffolding he gets a chance to look at it there's this unveiling everybody's like wow it's incredible Raphael steals his uh his um his painting style and then actually chips away part of his uh, school of Athens and puts a little um, right. character in there that is, is basically uh, Michelangelo. It's even though it's um, supposed to be some philosopher, I can't remember which one just because he admires what Michelangelo has done. I think it was but Socrates, Michelangelo wasn't looks, it? What, what's, who was it? I think Socrates, wasn't it? Uh, I don't think it's, it's no nah, Socrates is like white hair. You know, this was, uh, oh, okay. Her Her it might be Heraclides. Oh, okay. something. Uh, I don't, I don't really know the ancient philosophers that, that, that great, but anyway, okay. uh, so, but Michelangelo looks up at that first half and he's like, Hmm, 
I don't know about some of this. Uh, he didn't chip it all away, but if you look at the second half of the ceiling, you'll notice that uh, there's a lot larger figures. Uh, basically, he saw he saw from the floor for the first time the work and saw, ooh, you know, there's like a lot of figures in these different panels. It's kind of hard to read what's going on, etc. And so when he revisited it after uh, a break. Um, he started painting bigger figures. And actually the very first panel that he painted after that break is like one of the most uh, well-known, most recognizable uh, pieces of art ever, which is uh, the creation of Adam, where uh, his depiction of God is pointing out the finger and, and Adam is receiving life from, from God. And, you know, that's been um, immortalized in so many different uh advertisements or things yeah. like that. And, and, uh, I'm sure plenty Means. of coasters in the Vatican museum store or whatever. But, uh, uh, so th it's interesting because when you look closely at his work, you realize, okay, this seems like it's created by this, by this God kind of, but, uh, you know, he was still, uh, struggling through it like anybody and, uh, accounting for the things that maybe weren't going the way that he, one of them too, and uh, nobody really kn knew the better for it. One more thing to add to the story about him, th the sort of brand that he, he created for himself as this divine artist was that uh, as he was on his deathbed, he had uh, all of his drawings and all of his process work burned so nobody would see uh, just how much work it actually took for him to be this divine artist. I think that's really interesting about the brand of, about it. Do you, do you think that a lot of creatives don't focus too much on that? They focus too much on the actual production of it because perhaps in this day and age, maybe your brand is as important or even back then your brand was as important as it is the things that you create. So do you think a lot more creatives should focus on, on that aspect of it rather than just the creative output? You know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I feel like with, Michelangelo, it, uh, people like Michelangelo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, I feel like brand was incredibly important for them because they only, there were only so many clients they could have. There were only so many different ways that they could get, that they could get money. Um, and so we only got like popes and the Medici and, uh, mm -hmm the Sforza or whatever nobles there were as clients, like you get, you better pay attention to what it is that is interesting to them and, 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 uh, and act accordingly. This is why I think Raphael was the more person, the most personable of the three uh, masters who, who I've mentioned and um, really was a great schmoozer and networker. Um, and, and so I guess, but with modern day, you know, on, on social media and things like that, I feel like you have a little bit more wiggle room. And in fact, there's a, there's a little bit more of an opportunity for your brand to be more unique. It can be about you. I think it's something to be wary of though, is like, or, or aware of is that, well, maybe you don't have to appeal to one Pope or one noble person or, or what have you, but there are these you know, whoever it is that's always following this hashtag on Instagram or the people who are reading in this subreddit or sort of this section of Twitter, what's interesting to them thinking about it. it it's not you're not trying to appeal to one person, but you're kind of a, trying to appeal to one type of person. And mm -hmm. so I approach it as as like, well, what's interesting to me? What will I do naturally through my own curiosity and where does that Venn diagram overlap with um, some of these different uh, sort of uh, interest areas in which there are people who might be interested in my work. Something that I think about a lot is uh, in my own creation or content creation is if it's not beneficial to me and for someone who's going to listen to it then I don't tend to do it if that makes sense because i think what a lot of people do in the content creation game especially in 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 today's environment is they create solely for attention and i can understand why they might do that but i think that if it's not beneficial to you or the process of you creating something isn't beneficial to you in an education point of view or perhaps how you see yourself or you're actually improving your skill in being a content creator whatever that might be if that isn't part of it and helping and, and, and educating whatever might be others, 
then if if that isn't happening at the same time, then I think it can be quite detrimental. If it's not interesting to you as well as the way yeah, that you're just doing it solely out. for attention. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm realizing like, oh, you're somebody I should be asking questions about this sort of thing because you've got a massive, uh, you know, Instagram following and I believe TikTok following as well. Yeah, that's where <laughs> I first uh, encountered encountered your work. So, um, how do you think about that? Besides, just is it interesting to me? Is it interesting to them? What about don't you ever have things that you're interested in that you you kind of scratch your head and realize like I don't think anybody else cares. Uh yeah. <laughs> I, that happens all the time. There's so many things that I'm interested about that I don't create content in that medium. That's why I have a podcast. So that's why I've had an art historian on to talk about Michelangelo. Um I've had hit the same guy on to talk about uh, Michelangelo de Caravaggio he came in and talks about Caravaggio I've done other podcasts on the siege of Constantinople in 1453 I've done you know so many different types of podcasts and I think that it's just tailoring the type of content for the medium you know whether it be long form podcast and then you do sort of short form on Instagram or TikTok mm. or you do like a YouTube video that's more of a uh, you know how to take notes or how to write a book summary so I think it's just formatting your content creation based on the actual platform and sort of just going from there you know obviously i, think I, I was gonna say i i think i kind of get it maybe if it just if we can uh, if i can uh, interject and make sure yeah, that yeah, i'm understanding it. on the right track here so like with a podcast i think podcast is sort of, that's where like sort of the intellectual dark web has has happened because it's like if you tweet something and it's a thought that doesn't do well with a large audience for a variety of different reasons. Either it'll be dead or everybody will be pissed at you and they'll misinterpret <laughs> it and then they'll tar and feather you yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and cut your exactly. head off in the town square. Um, but if it's so an tend, audio... That's why, I tend to, that's why I tend to still avoid Twitter, to be honest. It's, it's one yeah. of the that I just tend to avoid. Yeah, and so, it, but if it's an audio and it's not a transcript, I mean, even if, even if there is a transcript available, it's like people, there's just this sort of threshold before anybody will even hear what you're saying. Uh, and there is an audience for that. Like I love to listen to four hour long podcasts and, um, and these, these conversations that, 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 that get deep and then might be about Caravaggio or, or something like that. So what you're saying, I think then is that you put the more obscure stuff, uh, like your conversation with me, uh, <laughs> on your, on your, on your podcast, because this is where the people who have a little bit more patience, uh, and who have perhaps proven that patience by even bothering to listen to a podcast instead of scrolling through you on TikTok until they get to the next, um, you know, guy dancing in front of the mirror uh, in, in his bathroom sink um, yes. that has 40 million views. Um, that's, that's how you choose what goes where. Exactly. And it's funny because when I talk about the podcast, I actually think the person who benefits most from the podcast is me. Mm -hmm. because I read the book, I do the research, I sort of formulate an, a, a script of like questions that I need to answer, uh, to ask, then, you know, have the conversation with the author, then go back, review the podcast. So then that's sort of like two forms of reviewing. Then, you know, sometimes I go back and listen back to it to try and improve for myself. So, you know, really the person that benefits the most is me. So you know, uh, and then anyone who listens to it benefits from it. And obviously we've had quite a few, this, you know, we've done 68 podcasts now. Um, so the way that I approach the podcast is I actually think the person who benefits is from me and then anyone who benefits after us, it's just, it's just, it's great after that, as you know, it's just sort of Yeah, plus. I think that's the right way. I, I've had a podcast now, Love Your Work for, since late 2015. So I guess we're getting like close to seven years Wow. Now, and I've certainly done a lot of interviews, but lately I've just been doing the, uh, my sharing my own thoughts, my own thought process. Yeah. And I kind of wanted a little extra space because preparing for interviews is a, is a lot of work, as you know. Mm. Uh, and I've, I, I think I'm going back to, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm preparing for one interview right now. Like just have one that I'm preparing <laughs> for. Um, and I guess, I guess one of the things that I discovered in that process was for a while there, I was like taking sponsors 
you know, I had like an agency and they were getting sponsorships for me and, you know, LinkedIn was sponsoring and, uh, you know, one of the stamp places, I don't know which one it was. I can't remember. It was just kind of embarrassing. Um, you know, I just had some like good sponsors on there, but I started to realize like, oh, I'm getting all these pitches for people who want me to interview me on their, who want me to interview them on my podcast. And like, why does this exist? And I just came to realize like, oh, it's because they think that I just need somebody to interview. Be and, and why would they, why would they think that? Well, they would think that if I had sponsors and I had a schedule uh, and, and interviewing another person meant more money from the sponsor. So I eliminated sponsors. And so now I don't have this perverse incentive anymore to like, mm -hmm. oh, let me interview somebody whose book I didn't read, whose book I didn't like, who maybe I don't mm -hmm. even like as a person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> uh, just because 100%. I'm going to earn a little bit of, uh, of revenue for that. I don't, I'm not that I would necessarily do that. And that was part of the reason why it was so uncomfortable to even have sponsors because I felt that weird pressure, which so is like, let's just eliminate sponsors. <laughs> or don't, don't you have to think about it anymore? It's it's one of the main reasons why I haven't done it on this podcast, because what I found is any time that I looked to have a sponsor on, it was automatically tagged with about five or 10 authors that needed to be pitched to come on. So it's like this expectation that you take this sponsorship from whether it be, you know, a company that has affiliations with authors or even a publisher to a degree. And, mm. you know, I have a look at the authors and they're not people that I would have on the podcast. Like I I'm very mm. selective on the type of people I have, you know, if I don't like what you say, or I don't like the vibe, then it's, it's a no go. <laughs> it's just a no go. Yeah. I wish I could say the exact same for myself, not to, I don't know. I can't, nobody comes to mind necessarily that I interviewed that uh, like, oh, I shouldn't have interviewed that person, but yeah, but it wasn't always, you know, I wanted, it, it mostly came from my own curiosity, people I wanted to talk mm. to and stuff. And, and, uh, but then I would occasionally get these pitches or feel this pressure to put people on my podcast. And I'd start to wonder like, hmm, should I interview this person or not? And I like it better. I think for me, it's like, I have a schedule for content creation. So mm. every two weeks, fortnightly, uh, I have a, a new article coming out. And I think for me, content with content creation, it's fine to be on a schedule because that pulls me to like do a little bit more content creation than I might otherwise. But at least at this current period in my thought process, it's better for interviews to happen completely organically. Okay. Uh, rather than to, I, for a while there it was, I was in that position where I loved like, okay, I'm gonna read this book. I'm going to study every, I'm going to listen to all the podcasts that this person has been on. I really can't wait to to chat with this person. And, uh, and having that schedule, that commitment ahead of time where I was going to do a certain number of these conversations anyway, uh, was useful. And to some extent, I, I mean, I certainly miss part of it, but I also like having the space to, to create for myself. But I think that those two, those, it, those are two different ways to look at having a schedule, right? Is mm. like, is this, I think, I think it comes down to this. Like I try to make it so that what, the things I create in my business, it's, it's not so much about uh, what I'm going to make, but who is it going to make? Uh, who is it? It's not so much about what I'm going to make. It's what is it going to make out of me? Okay. Can you expand on that a bit? Yeah. So, so if I want to be well read, um, what can I commit to myself to create that will cause me to read more books? Yes. So one of those things I do is uh, I do a decent number of, um, book summaries or I've done podcast summaries. I did a summary of the Unabomber manifesto the other day. Cause it was just like, oh, this is interesting stuff that I want to get to know a little bit better. And then in some of these cases, you can't talk to the authors cause they're, uh, they're dead or they're yes. too big of a deal or they're in jail cause they're a terrorist. Yes. Uh, 
and uh, <laughs> that's not ideal, you, is it? Yeah, you don't, yeah, want, you, you, don't, you don't want to go to prison and start interviewing people that become Louis Thoreau. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And, and, and so, and so, if it's something that I, that I want to be interested in anyway, then it's it's nice to have something I'm going to create in the process of of consuming that thing. So in a way, it's like like I was saying earlier that the product is not the process. But sometimes the process can be a product. And that product is like, here's the article that I wrote um, from this book that I read, or here's yeah. the interview that I made from from getting interested in this particular person's work. So it's not so much what am I going to make, it's what is it going to make of me? Yeah, it's interesting that, that, that thought of like the product is... Uh, sorry, the process is the product. So one thing that I've been debating with, and I've been speaking about this with one of my um, author friends, Adam Lowenstein, who's been on the podcast a couple of times, and he's a he's a writer as well. And one of the things that I've been talking about is I've been umming and ahhing for years about doing like a vlog as part of my on, on my YouTube channel and making the process like a product. And I, I don't know why I have this aversion to it, but I seem to just haven't got round to actually doing it as part of my Mm -hmm. thinking because the way that I think about it and this might be a crux and potentially I might get your thinking about it now is the idea that it will be taking away time from doing something else whether it be a podcast or whether it be you know a project a software engineering product that I'm working on you know my job <laughs> my actual full-time job so uh, do you think that that's like a wrong way to approach it or do you think that potentially I might be missing out on making like the the, the process an actual product no, I think that is a, a great way to think about it. I am always very wary of um, hidden complexity. We're yes. very bad at understanding complexity. We're very bad at understanding how one decision can lead to a thousand decisions. Um, and I think a perfect example of that is the birthday problem, the birthday paradox, which is basically how many people have to be in a room before two of them have the same birthday. And most people guess like 150, 180, something like that. I won't put you on the spot and embarrass you by asking your guess. 12. But it's, oh, well, okay, right. You're, 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 you're closer. So it's 23. Okay. Um, it's and, and they just, what people don't, <laughs> what we don't expect is that like, oh, each time you add a person that like creates these interactions with these other things. So if you add the vlog, well, then there's like a thousand other things you've got to do in addition to doing the vlog. It seems like, oh, the process is just part of the product is, is, it's just the no. product there. And even if you try to like, oh, I've got this assistant that's going to do it. Like, well, you're managing a person now. And so now that's complicated. Yeah. And uh, this is why I used to have an assistant for a while. And now I don't um, because it's a much better filter to just be like, oh, if it's something that requires an assistant, generally, uh, I'll just not do it. <laughs> like, that's probably the better choice and, and just try to do a better job of the things that I'm doing because... You and I are in the business of, uh, of leveraging media. Uh, this is an idea that Naval Ravikant talked a lot, has talked a lot about. And so if you're leveraging media, you can leverage three, three types of leverage he talks about. So the capital, labor, media. So capital, you've got to have got a bunch of money. If you put a bunch of money into, say, some sort of ad or uh, you just it, put it in an investment and that, you know, you make money that way. Or labor, you manage, you're good at managing people and you can pay them a lower wage than what it is that you're making in the business. That's one mm -hmm. way to get leverage. Another way to get leverage is media. And it's like the most powerful media. If you get on TikTok, you get on Twitter. If you got, if you can hit that right, your reach is unlimited. Uh, and how do you apply, how do you make a lever have uh, apply more force? Or result in more force. Well, one of the ways you can move the fulcrum, and I don't know, that can be a metaphor for a lot of different things, but one of the ways is yeah. just like make the work better, make the force of the work better. And I get caught in the trap all the time of like, oh, maybe there's this one little trick I can do that'll make uh, cause more reach or, or, or what have you. And I might try that for a while, but it's got to keep going back to like, okay, how can I make this better? Um, do I always accomplish that? No, but do you well, think, like think a large do do you think a large part of that is just being consistent? Because that's what I found it to be with content creation specifically. Is you can think about a hack, you can think about a tactic to get growth or reach or whatever it might be, um, a certain type of content. But I think at the end of the day, you know, after a couple of years of of doing it, I've found just doing it 
consistently mm-hmm. is <clears throat> as important as any other hack that you're going to get. A- yeah, I think there's there's a consistency bias in online media, which I find a little unfortunate. Um, and I think that, I mean, part of it is, it is like, say, TikTok or Twitter or for a while their medium, I don't really know how medium works anymore. Uh, I try, but mm-hmm. there was just, they want you to use it too, right? And so there's something in the algorithm on TikTok, you've got to like use it a certain amount and then you put it, and then your your content is going to perform better. Or yeah. Twitter's algorithm is like reading tea leaves sometimes. Um, and there's the consistency bias there. If you're tweeting regularly, somehow you start getting more, uh, more impressions. So there is that component of consistency, which is, is this appealing to the algorithm that you're trying to, uh, appeal to, mm-hmm. um, which, but then there's also another element of consistency. And this is maybe the part that's important, uh, regardless of the algorithm is that consistency can help reduce that barrier um, if you're a perfectionist and mm. you tend to just keep on messing with something and never actually ship it, uh, yes. having some sort of rule in place where you're going to ship anyway, I think can reduce some of that. It's not probably not good if you're just sloppy by nature and, <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> but I also think that there's with that consistency, it, it makes your work better too, because, um, through enough iterations, you just, you just get better at it. So there's that element. I, was, I, 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 I think try to go element... more on the, 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 the former than the latter. So like with, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking about like with, with Twitter and rules. So like recently I, I realized, okay, I'm using Twitter too much. It's my addiction. That's the thing that I'm like really into. Mm-hmm. And so I've like created yeah. rules like, okay, I'm going to check Twitter these times. I'm going to block it on all these things. And I'm not going to post anything that I haven't, uh, you know, uh, scheduled at least one day in advance. And those are my rules. And would I get more exposure on Twitter if I was on there all day? Yeah, I would. But would my idea, I, I think my ideas will be better if I'm not on Twitter. Twitter's the, the best place to share your idea. It's the worst place to have it. I like that. I like that. I've actually found YouTube to be a really interesting medium for me away from sort of the short term ones. And it's something that I want to focus on personally, because the thing I love about YouTube is that it it seems to be not a place where the more you spend on it, the more appeal that you have. It's purely down to the video, the quality of the video that you create. Um, I feel like the single video is is more important than, say, the channel at large. Well, it's not, not, not in that respect It's like you said about Twitter, like the longer you spend on, uh, you spend on it, there seems to be an algorithm to suggest that, you know, you will get more impressions. But I think the, if you make a quality video on YouTube, regardless of how long you spend on YouTube, it's going to do well. Like I haven't made a video on YouTube now for a couple of months because I've been focusing on other projects on my personal channel. And I have one video that's got like now over like 120,000 views on how to take notes. And I haven't really spent any time on YouTube really on my personal channel. So it seems to be on that platform more than others. It doesn't really, there's no real correlation between time spent and, and people watching it just down to the quality of the content. Yeah, I have found that to be true myself. I have a YouTube channel. It's not something that I invest a lot in because Mm -hmm. It just seems like, again, like one of these things, well, what's that going to take away from some other yeah, thing? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, which I do think it's worthwhile to do a little experiment every once in a while with a medium. Like I got on TikTok and experimented with it. And that's where I found you. And now I've deleted TikTok from my phone and something's going on in my account. And I don't even, I don't even know because I haven't seen it. So yeah. I do like to do those experiments too. But uh, I found that to be true with YouTube where like my most popular YouTube video is about like how to wash your clothes in the sink because that was just something that i would do when i would travel sometimes people need to know yeah it's got like i don't know probably close to a million views by now and i think this is something that gets missed a lot in a lot of conversations is everybody seems to be worried be thinking about brand 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 and how do i build my following and how do i appeal to uh such and such algorithm to go viral for this one thing but i i think seo is still not dead 
I, mm. I think like topical things that people are searching for is still not dead. Uh, and, uh, you know, like when I write a book summary, I'm like writing a summary about a book that I like, which will tend to uh, appeal to people who would like my books. And so people who are searching for that summary, they end up on that book summary and then they discover this author and maybe they check out uh, some of my books or things like that with, with YouTube is, is what are people going to search for that you know something about? And I think like the optimal strategy is probably like a little bit of this SEO and then a little bit of this uh, sort of the brand sort of things. But I feel like it doesn't, uh, maybe it doesn't get the lip service that it, it deserves. It's, it, it seems like it's a little bit more. It's It's strangely... It, it's strange to me that it, people seem to expect more that like, oh, it's going to be more about, um, I don't know, choosing, maybe choosing the right hashtag. Maybe that is an SEO thing, but whatever people mm. talk about how to go viral on TikTok or, or Well, Twitter it's one of those something. things like for me, it's like when I think about mine at the moment, it's like you can spend all your time and intention making a TikTok or a reel or something like that, which might get lots of views in like a week's period of time. Or you can spend that time and intention, make a really, really good YouTube video. And that could last mm. a lot longer than one of those things. Like people could watch that for an extended period of time. Whereas a reel or a TikTok, people watch it, it gets lots of views in like a week, but then, you know, in two weeks no one's watching it whereas with a youtube video it seems to be the complete opposite it seems to be in a year people like thousands of people could be watching that youtube video whereas no one watched it in the last yeah. two weeks well right and then the people who are watching it on tiktok like no offense are but they are, those are the they people really watching you, it yeah <laughs> yeah like the, I, I had this thought the other day is that they call it the attention economy but it, attention it's like a pretty generous word uh, for what we're doing on TikTok and Twitter and Instagram. Attention? We're paying attention? I don't think so. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, something, it's the it's quality something... of the attention. <laughs> the quality of the attention makes a big difference. And that's something that I've noticed also is is, is that sometimes you, you can write a blog post or you can create some piece of content and the number of people who are checking it out is quite low, but you're having a tremendous impact on those people. Uh, case Definitely. in point, there, there's a guy, Alex Burkett, who wrote this great piece on the barbell strategy for content um, for uh, content marketing? And I was really getting into uh, Nassim Taleb's ideas. He mm -hmm. wrote about the barbell strategy, which a lot of people are probably familiar with, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little bit maybe we might have talked about a little bit. And I thought, hmm, is there a barbell strategy to content uh, to, to to content marketing? And I searched mm. for barbell strategy content marketing or something like that. Yeah, and yeah. here I found this amazing article, super in-depth, about a barbell strategy for content optimization. And I reached out to Alex and I said, this is awesome. And then I ended up being on his podcast. And when he was in, in Medellin, we went to dinner together and stuff. And we talked mm. about this. It's like, well, how many people actually read that, that article? Like, very, very few. But yeah. here we are having dinner together. Here I was on his podcast for a couple hours, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, like what, what really, what really was the value of that piece of content? Just because it got so I've, few views, does that mean it's not valuable? I found that so, so much to be the case with the podcast, because obviously the podcast doesn't get like thousands and thousands of views, but the amount of authors and people that I've met, like one, one really great example is I had one author on the podcast. He wrote this book on new political capitalism and he funds, he helps fund this uh, political think tank group in the UK. And he invited me to now chair a conversation with a politician and two business leaders at a live event in Bristol. And I thought mm -hmm. that podcast only has like a couple of hundred views, but now I'm going to be doing chairing a conversation with a politician and two business leaders at a live event. So yeah. I'm like, well, fine, I could spend, get 250,000 views on a TikTok video, but that's not going to have the same outcome as that. They just, yeah. there's, there's no correlation. Who are the people you're reaching? Which I think it, it's like, as the internet has matured, it's become, uh, you have had to be more discerning with that, where it used to be, you know, maybe I'd have, I'd write a post and it would get 30,000 views in a couple of days and they'd be on Hacker News and it'd be all these like techies who are into the internet are uh, into technology and like they would have, they'd be, uh, you know, a good target audience. But now it's like, well, who are you getting the views from? If it's just random people on TikTok who aren't, who are just looking for something to make them not bored for a moment. Um, mm -hmm. 
you got to be a little discerning about who uh, who your content is for. Yeah, I think that's such a great thing that I think a lot of people who are creators need to think about is like, I think it goes back to what I said previously is if it's benefiting you and it's benefiting a select number of individuals that are really into that subject, that's all that I think matters. I think if you stray too much onto just benefiting yourself, then it can be dangerous and just benefiting people, not really thinking about yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think it can get dangerous as well. So I think in that Venn diagram, it really needs to be tightly, you know, in the, in the center. Yeah. This is why I, I deleted, uh, uh, Google Analytics from my blog like a year ago. I think they've since made some sort of change with it, but I deleted it. I had I had it for 15 years. Mm -hmm. I deleted Google Analytics. I do have an analytics platform now, but it doesn't have like all the cookie stuff where I'm I'm not like tracking people, seeing exactly where they go or something like that. And part of the reason is I realized that like, well, if everybody is creating what they create based off of the same metrics. Uh, and they're using the same tools to read those metrics, then eventually all your work's going to be the same. Yes. Uh, that's not technically true, but you know, it, it, it can be a way to like, yes. okay, I'm not paying attention to that metric anymore. I'm just going to pay attention. Is this interesting to me? And then maybe, you know, using a little bit of strategy here and there, sprinkling a little bit in there, but most important, is this interesting to you? Does it, on, is on it that something point, you believe? On that point, on the sh like we, we've spent a lot of time talking about sort of like that short term content creation. Yeah. I've found a lot of people in my space, in the book space, focus so much of their time attention on the reels or the TikTok and that type of stuff, which is really beneficial now. But the, one of the reasons why I spend so much time and attention on the podcast is the podcast can be something that lasts a longer period of time than that specific activity. Now, I've seen a lot of people that have started a podcast doing with authors and have somewhat stopped and moved away from it to focus on the other stuff. And that's something that I don't want to do because, as we've discussed, like something that is really beneficial or, or that interaction that you had with, with the person about the barbell strategy, you just never know those types of interactions that you have have been so beneficial. And I think I think focusing on, on that short-term metric can be can be, you know, perhaps... Um, not valuable in the in the long term. Yeah, and I think people get frustrated by it because it sounds a little hand wavy. It sounds a little, it sounds a little random. But I mean, I think that's actually something that you have to accept, which is something that's inherent in uh, Taleb's ideas and the idea of the barbell strategy. Is that a lot of the successes that we have are not things that we could have made happen. They are things that happen randomly. Almost yeah. by definition, if it's something that you can make happen and predict, if you know that action A is going to lead to result B, it's generally not going to be interesting. It's generally not going to lead to a great amount of success. And generally, there's going to be a million other people doing the exact same thing. You've mm. got to be putting stuff out there uh, that is is sort of random uh, and a little crazy uh, maybe there are silly ideas that you don't think will work or that you think are too dumb to work and you put those things out there and then you have these things happen that you never would have expected. Now, do you do that with everything? No, not necessarily. That's what the barbell strategy is about. Is it one side of the barbell is the things that are kind of the sure bets? Like maybe that is your SEO content that you know you're going to get some, uh, you, you know, you're going to get some traffic from or something like that. Yeah, then yeah. you've got the other things you're like, you know, I just think that this is interesting and I want to share this. And yeah. that's where you get the things that are really surprising that you never could have expected mm -hmm. that can lead to the the larger successes. Definitely. I, and I think that is perhaps a, a, a nice way to sort of wrap up the conversation is like this idea that, you know, when you approach your creativity or your mind management, not time management, is thinking about how you can balance everything to to get, you know, the maximum output and 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 really get what you're you're looking for out of the things that you do. Um, so before we end, David, I think it'd be great just for you to talk about uh, some of the books that you think, because we're a Brooks podcast, obviously. Uh, mm. So it'd be great to talk about some of the books that you think have influenced you the most, perhaps like a list of maybe three to five, perhaps on this subject that you wrote, you know, this book on, or perhaps some that have had the most impact on you. Uh, if I were to choose, let's try three. Uh, one would be, uh, Pride and Prejudice, um, okay, Jane, Jane Austen, Austen. <laughs> and it. another would be the most recent 
book that, uh, yeah, maybe in the last 10 years it's had the most influence on me would be um, Understanding Media by Marshall McLuhan. Okay. And, and then I guess I, uh, third, I'd probably have to choose the four hour work week because that's kind of what a lot of my life and work is based upon. Now, okay. I, I want to just, just quickly explain the Pride and Prejudice, which is because yeah, I, I want to, I want, I want to hear this. <laughs> yeah. So I, w- I was 25 years old. I was a college graduate. I had just gotten out of like a really toxic relationship and I was living in Omaha, Nebraska and, um, and didn't want to be living there. And that was where I grew up. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm kind of dumb. I I need to, I should read some books. 25. I should read some books. And so the Omaha Public Library would have these book sales. uh, You could go to bring a canvas bag and for 25 cents, 50 cents, a dollar, you could buy all these books. And so my rule was, if I've heard of it, I'm just going to buy it put it in the canvas bag, take it home, and hopefully at some point read it. And so the first book that I bought and read was Pride and Prejudice because, oh, I've heard of that. And so I just remember reading that book and I I could feel my brain changing as I was reading it. I'm like reading each sentence like five times over, like what is Mr. Darcy saying? I don't understand. (laughs) Like it's it's sort of like old English... uh, you know, way of speaking, what are you talking about? And there's all, everything's very like, there's sort of the subtext to yep. everything that's being said. And I couldn't even tell you much about the book now other than there's Mr. Darcy. Um, and, uh, and that was just, I could feel it, uh, like, 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 like a sponge just absorbing water for the first time kind of. Mm. And that was sort of set me on the journey of, of, being a more intense reader and that was 18 years ago i love that story i had that with the great gatsby when i studied that english literature at school i read the great gatsby by um f scott fitzgerald i think f scott fitzgerald yeah and and i the subtext the uh the relationship between you know the american recession and you know the the times. You know the disparity, the wealth disparity, the the characters. The characters are really interesting. The narrator, um, yeah, I, that was one of the books that I read, and I, I, it completely changed my way about how I see literature. Because before mm-hmm. that, and I read that maybe when I was twelve, thirteen, because um, we studied it at school, uh, and. Before that, I was only reading like Roald Dahl, which are like children's oh, books, wow. like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or, you know, Matilda. And then I just went straight to F. Scott Fitzgerald. There was like nothing in between. 12 or 13. I mean, it's funny because <laughs> even when I was reading these books at 25, I was catching up on all the things like Grapes of Wrath and things that I supposedly yeah. was assigned at some point, but I don't remember yeah, yeah. being assigned them. Uh, Catcher in the Rye, which is still love. Mm. Um, was I just thinking like, well, I'm, t- uh, I'm like, I wouldn't have understood this when I was 15 <laughs> or, or even or 22. I, I probably didn't understand it at 25, but I thought, I thought I did. Um, uh, so yeah, anyway, th- that's one of the other one that I think though, uh, understanding media, I, I feel like, uh, mm. uh, we've just had a lot of conversations about some very specific things about media. And, uh, I think that's something that I hadn't thought about very much, which is funny because I'm a, a designer and I'd heard the quote media, uh, the medium is the message. Um, but I never really understood it really until I read Marsha McLuhan's work. And now I, I, th- I think about media, it's just what been one of my most, uh, the subject I'm most interested in the last couple of years, I think is just yeah. media and the influence of media on, on the message. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, I think those are three great additions to anyone's reading list. Thank you. Thank you for that, David. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast to discuss elements from your book, uh, Mind Management, Not Time Management, right here. Um, David, where's the best place that individuals can find you, whether it be social media or, or website? Yeah, I know you're not big on Twitter, but uh, Twitter is great <laughs> for me. I use Twitter all the time. That's Academy, it d- doesn't matter if I'm not on it. It's whether anyone yeah, yeah. is listening. Is yeah, on yeah. It. <laughs> and then my podcast, uh, Love Your Work, is where I share all my ideas. Um, and even before I share my ideas in either of those places, my Love Mondays newsletter, uh, which is at Cadavy.net slash Mondays, or actually just go to 
if you're on mobile, just type in kdv.co and you'll be on my website. Perfect. Yeah, I'll put all the links to those in the description below so people can go check that out. Thank you so much, David, again. Thank you, Un. Um. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Hopefully you took away some amazing points that David was able to talk about. And I definitely recommend picking up his book, Mind Management, Not Time Management. I'll put a link in the description below as well. And I'll put a link to David's website as well. He's got some really interesting articles uh, that you can check out and read as well, as well as his, his book as well. So I definitely recommend uh, checking that out. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to the podcast every week sort of. <laughs> I release a podcast where I speak to an author about the principles and ideas within their book as well. So we have some amazing authors lined up in the next couple of weeks. So definitely hit the subscribe button uh, to stay tuned for that. Thank you so much for tuning in again, and I'll see you in the next episode.